All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Oliver Schrauss. I'm a uh, senior policy analyst at the Charles Koch Institute, and it is my pleasure tonight to welcome you to this uh, latest installment of our Butcher Baker Brewer series of events. And I would especially like to thank the Federalist Society uh, for co-sponsoring this event with us tonight. Uh, thinking of tonight's event put me in mind of a moment not at long after I joined our organization, uh, April 29th, 2011. And I still remember many of my colleagues stumbling in, maybe a little bit late, uh, kind of bleary, baggy eyes, and very tightly clutched coffees. And I, I was confused at this until several of them shuffled over to ask me, uh, did you get up to watch the royal wedding this morning? <laughs> As it happens, I did not. In fact, I was the other sort of person, the kind who went around that day theatrically saying, uh, I thought the whole point of this country was that we didn't have to deal with all that royalty nonsense. Tonight, Frank Buckley is here to tell me that I may have been too hasty. Uh, professor Buckley is a George Mason University Foundation Professor of Law and has previously taught at the University of Chicago Law and at the Sorbonne. He is a prolific author with recent books including uh, The American Illness, Essays on the Rule of Law, and Fair Governance. His new, his new book, The Once and Future King, The Rise of Crown Government in America, challenges some of America's favorite notions about itself, its status as the freest nation in the world, uh, the protective power of its constitution, and above all, its avoidance of rule by one man or one woman. The Charles Koch Institute believes that intriguing ideas like these can help illuminate the social institutions that encourage or inhibit the well-being of those who live under them. As more than 2,000 alumni of our educational programs can tell you, CKI is committed to exploring well-being through research, education, and dialogue. And to help with that dialogue tonight, we have Nicholas Quinn Rosencrantz. He is a professor of law at Georgetown and a senior fellow in constitutional studies at the Cato Institute. And he frequently testifies before Congress as a constitutional expert. He is also co-chairman of the Board of Visitors of the Federalist Society, tonight's co-sponsor. So ladies and gentlemen, Frank Buckley and Professor Nick Rosencrantz. Thanks so much. So we're delighted to be here this evening. We are celebrating the publication of this book by Professor Buckley to my right, The Once and Future King, The Rise of Crown Government in America. And I can tell you, I have just read it and it is a treat. It is uh, written with uh, verve and it is provocative and uh, it is obviously extremely timely. It is uh, informs many of the um, issues that you will find on the front page of your newspaper this very day. So uh, it's a treat to be here to celebrate this book. Uh, the event is really Professor Buckley's event. I'm here just to facilitate a conversation, maybe ask a couple of gentle questions, and then we're going to <coughs> Uh, open it up to questions from you all. We're anxious to hear what you'd like to say. But so uh, it's great to be here with you. I think we'd like to start, if we could, by just hearing your thesis. If you could just get it out on the table for sure. us and tell us what the book's about. Let me first of all thank the Charles Koch Institute and the Federalist Society and all of you for showing up. Uh, for an author, being able to speak to a whole group of people about what you're interested in is is delightful, and if you're all holding a copy of this book, it's very heaven. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very happy to be here and uh, very happy to see all of you. The, uh, the thesis is very simple. I want to argue that Obama is the, will be, will be the most consequential president since George Washington. Uh, Washington was, of course, important because while he could have been king, he chose to retire to his farm in, in Mount Vernon. And when George III heard that, he said that, has he done that? Then he is the greatest gentleman in the world. And Obama, by contrast, has taken us to a new level of government, which approaches the kingly government of George III, and that is what makes him, I think, or will make him the most consequential uh, president uh, since Washington. So we'll talk about the direction of crown government in America. I should note that I'm not uh, an expert in constitution, American constitutional law, indeed. I wrote the book as a Canadian, but last month became an American. Um, <laughs> wait, wait. 
The date was April 15. <laughs> it was welcome to the country. Here's the bill. <laughs> so I am bisystemic, as we uh, say in Canada, both, both systems. Um, uh, so the book upends the conventional wisdom about separation of powers. So you know, maybe you could just talk a bit about what, what was the conventional wisdom when you sat down to write this and the ways in which you think they had it wrong. Well, here's what American constitutional law comes down to me when it, when it comes to the powers of a central government. There are really only two things that matter. One is the requirement of an election every four years, and the other is the 22nd Amendment, uh, term limits. Uh, the latter is not terribly important. It's not important in Argentina. I don't know if it's very important here. But as for the rest, we're talking about a constitutional structure where uh, all the cards are held by the president. He can make laws by executive diktat. He can unmake laws that he doesn't like. Um, constitutional scholars are busy finding ways to attack the president for not uh, enforcing the laws. I don't think they'll go anywhere. We can talk about that. So he can do what he wants and not do what he wants, and uh, George III would envy that. Then there's the spending power, just a little, for instance, in the TARP bailout, and I can't think of that, with, or I can't think of too big to fail without getting physically ill, but in the bailout, the bailout was, remember, for financial institutions, but of the $800 billion, 80 went for car manufacturers. These were not financial institutions. You may perhaps recall the constitutional crisis that happened when we discovered that money was being spent without an appropriation. And if so, you're better than me because I can't remember. So he spends the money as he will. Um, and he can go to war or not whenever he will. So what is that if not crown government? I'm surprised to hear you say that the 22nd Amendment's not very important. I would have thought that a hallmark of crown government is an executive for life. Well, yes, except the Argentinian solution looms before us. The Argentinian solution is one where a spouse succeeds a spouse. So um, is that possible here? I shouldn't have thought. we would never see anything like that here, <laughs> the way they do it in Argentina. Um, why would that be such a bar to an ambitious president? Well, that's a fair point. Uh, so do you think, maybe you could speak a bit about uh, some of the other recent controversies. You mentioned uh, TARP. What, um, what are your thoughts on, for example, the IRS controversy and how does it fit in within your thesis? <clears throat> um, on rankings of freedom, this is not the freest country in the world, is it? I mean, on, on Heritage runs these, these, these uh, rankings. So does Fraser slash Cato. Uh, on Cato, I think United States is 17 at this point and dropping like a stone. One of the elements in this is measures of corruption. Corruption is measured by Transparency International. Transparency International ranks this as the 23rd least corrupt country in the world. I think that's really generous. I think America is far more corrupt than that. I mean, it has Israel, for example, more corrupt than America. I don't believe that for a second. I think America has been coasting on its reputation in these rankings, rankings with respect to corruption, rankings with respect to rule of law. When you have a system where the government is able to uh, attack enemies of the people, notorious felons like Dinesh D'Souza, Conrad Black, Martha Stewart, what was that all about? Uh, and the press is there just cheering them on. Then you have an opening for corruption of a kind which one doesn't see much of in the rest of the first world. So I think there's a tendency always to think of this as a rather Simon Pure country. I mean, uh, you know, when, when people ask me, 23rd? How did we get so low? I, I, I always say, well, there's this place called Illinois, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> well, um, I think it's rather dangerous to have that concentration of power in the hands of people who are willing to use it for political ends and where there's no outcry from the press when that happens. And, and that, it seems to me, is, is where the United States roughly is. I don't say this is Russia, for God's sakes, but it's not New Zealand, is it? 
But so speak specifically to the IRS. Well, um, you know, I thought I had in the sense that it struck me as a case where we're referring to the Tea Party. Yeah. Yes. It struck me as a case where um, bureaucrats, regulators were being directed by politicians to attack political enemies of the way they do in less free countries. Um, I'm not sure what you're asking. Are is you that, saying, is, is that, what, will the select committee do anything? I don't think it will. Yeah. Here's a big difference. Well, we'll get into parliamentary versus presidential, but, but there is a select committee. I'm, perhaps that's what you're referring to. Well, here's the point. <laughs> to quote somebody, at this point, what difference does it make? It was two years ago. The ability of the administration, of any administration, to sit on a scandal and bury it for a couple of years is a pretty effective way of, of, of turning a scandal into a non-event. The best uh, study of the impeachment power, uh, Mark Rozelle's book on impeachment, said that Clinton survived because he, you know, he ran the ball and he made the issue all about Ken Starr. So here we are a couple of years after, getting into a couple of years after Benghazi. Uh, the IRS scandal is um, similar. In a parliamentary system, the ability of the opposition to take an issue and lead off with it during question period, day after day after day, can topple a government. Whereas here, whatever, however good the committees are, they come at it too late and a dollar short. I could, you know, there, there, there are plenty of examples of, uh, as I say, of a, of, a, of a government that simply toppled over issues like that. Uh, in, in Canada, the issue, it was the, the pipeline debate in 1956. Uh, the government invoked closure, uh, seemed arrogant, begged to be taken down a peg, and a year later the voters had complied. I, I just, I don't, I don't see the resolution of these kinds of problems in the courts or in Congress. I think ultimately it's a matter of the voters, and I haven't detected a great deal of interest amongst the voters. Yeah. You mentioned that you don't think the answer is the courts. Is that, the, so many of these, many of the um, current controversies involve uh, president, um, President declining to enforce statutes. Right. And uh, it's traditionally thought that uh, maybe nobody has standing to challenge such actions. Uh, there's uh, a, the um, current doctrine is very hostile to legislative standing. Now, so that's, I think, what you're referring to when you say it's unlikely that the courts are going to. Oh, I, I would even be more generous than that. Um, you're, you're referring to an effort to. Um, I guess go after, this was a Ron Dellum's litigation in the late 1970s with respect to the War Powers Act. And the court held that seven congressmen by themselves were not a, did not have standing to impeach a decision not to do something. But even were it the case that, um, you know, somehow John Boehner decided that he wanted to do something, even assuming that the Republicans won the majority of, of the Senate, I'm not sure what difference that would make. I think, look, look, I think there are three reasons why this wouldn't go anywhere. The first reason is because um, even if there was a successful Supreme Court decision about the non-enforcement power, right, the precedent value of such a decision, I think, would be slight. It would deal with that particular act of non-enforcement or non-act, but there are a whole range of reasons why a president may decide not to uh, enforce a law, and he could go on his merry way with respect to all of those other statutes, you know, without regard to that decision. The second reason is, I think the Supreme Court notoriously would want to keep its hands out of those kinds of political decisions. So um, I'm not sure that you'd get the result you wanted from the Supreme Court in any event. But maybe most importantly, I don't, I'm not sure there's a political will to even do this. I mean, we're asking, would there be a political will on the part of Congress, which took so long to strike a select committee with respect to Benghazi, uh, to start litigating these kinds of issues? Bear in mind, when, when Obama decides not to enforce a statute, he often, I think, does so within cases where he would have a majority of the American voters behind him. So if that's the case, 
I'm not surprised that there hasn't been litigation over these issues. In corporate law, there's something called the business judgment rule. The idea behind the business judgment rule is roughly you do not need to teach your grandmother how to suck eggs, and you don't have to teach a businessman how to make money. And there's a political version of this a, a, uh, uh, in, in which you don't have to tell politicians how to get votes, right? So I may have my own opinions as to what, what the Republicans should do, but I don't have the skin in the game that they do. So if they decide not to pursue something, and they haven't pursued this non-enforcement power as I describe it, then it may be that they know more about how the voters would behave than I do. I don't see it going anywhere. And therefore, I think, rather than think of this as some kind of illegal or unconstitutional act by the president, the decision not to enforce a law, I think it's better to see it as simply a part of the president's prerogative powers, like the royal prerogative of a king. Well, so I'm not sure I follow that last point. Are you objecting to the structure that we have, or do you think that the structure is correct, but people are flouting its restrictions? You talked before about separation of powers. Uh, we didn't pick up on that. I see the separation of powers doctrine at this point as something which serves to immunize a president from attack. It's always as it was with Richard Nixon, a case of it's not me, it's this higher office, the presidency. So uh, the separation of powers serves wonderfully to empower a president who has control over all of the information in town, pretty much, and who can release it as he wishes and who can uh, use the majesty of his office to oppose any attempts by Congress to rein him in. Um, it's no longer, I think, a government of separation of powers. I think it's a government of presidential rule. Let's put it this way. We have an election coming up in November. Does it matter? I mean, really. I mean, does it matter if, say, the Senate flips over to the Republicans? Why should it matter? I was talking to somebody, a columnist, about this a few days back. He said, oh, yes, well, then they'll, they'll have bills, and they'll send them out to the White House for signature. Yes, well, <laughs> that's going to do something? You know, that and three bucks will give you a cup of coffee at Starbucks? I don't, th see it, it, I don't think it'll matter very much. I think we're beyond congressional rule or the separation of powers. We're in a regime of presidential rule. And, and the donors are beginning to recognize this because, as one has read in the newspaper, donor money is flowing into Hillary's campaign in 2016 rather than in the congressionals of this November. That's purely rational. Again, it doesn't really matter, I don't think, if I'm right, who controls the Congress in November or January. Do you believe these to be structural flaws? And as do you, do you believe that things would be better if the constitutional structure were somehow different? Yes, indeed. Um, this is where I you know, fly my maple leaf, I suppose. Hmm. Uh, the only problem is one can't get there from here, right? There are people who talk about Article 5. Um, I had a course on the framers at my law school named after the never-too-much-to-be-praised George Mason. And at the end of it, I said, right, it's Article 5 time, and we're going to try to amend the Constitution, and everything's up for grabs. Runaway convention. And nobody really wanted to change anything much. I mean, I, I said, well, let's get rid of a Senate. They're you know, a bunch of blowhards. You won't miss them. <laughs> and no, they wanted the Senate. I mean, it, we went down the list, and you know, it, it was the same dreary result in the end as we have now. It's not what the framers wanted. There's this great myth about the framers, about their constitution, and it's derived from people who didn't read the notes of Madison and the other delegates and who read the Federalist Papers, right? Um, I think what they wanted more than anything was, the, was not George III. What they were really concerned about was the accumulation of power in the hands of one person. And that one person would be, George Mason said, an elected monarch if he were elected by the people. That's why what they gave us was they thought a regime in which the people would not elect the president. That would be an elected monarchy worse still, said Mason, than the real thing. Why? Because if you're elected, you have a legitimacy that a hereditary monarch lacks. So... Mason, I think, was right with that respect. But the framers didn't get what they wanted. To say that 
they didn't understand where we'd be 225 years later is merely to say that they weren't omniscient. That's not a great failing. They thought that 95% of the time, presidents would be chosen by the House of Representatives, voting by state. That's, it didn't work out that way. Rather, we saw the emergence of political parties, and we saw national candidates. Uh, it was kicked over to the House twice, once in 1800, once in 1824. We might have gotten there in 2000 if they had disqualified Florida. But, but, but apart from that, no. So, one so you, can't, you can't get congressional government, I think, out of what we have. But I, I should like to see a president having to face a House of Commons. You know, when Obama went over to India to speak at the Lok Sabha in 2010, he brought his teleprompter, and the parliamentarians were saying, you know, well, what's this? You know, we don't do this, right? Um, rather, you have to be able to stand on your feet and answer questions and do it in a witty manner. And in Canada, dans les deux langues officielles du pays, which, is, which would be hard for most people. And we'd have a very different kind of government. I think Clinton would have done okay. Daniel Patrick Moynihan would have done fine for a fondness of liquor, doesn't seem to disqualify prime ministers. The 19th century might have been the era of Henry Clay. It would have been a very different kind of government, right? So, but we can't do that. But you know what the, you know what the really big difference is, in, in my view? And it, you don't notice it unless I think you, you move here from another country. And that's the fact that you have the head of state as head of government in this country. I say, I, what I call Jack Spratt's law is one should separate the two offices. You should separate the fat of the ceremonial head of state from the lean meat of head of government. Because right now, there are people who simply revere the president, whoever he is, right? You have Peggy Noonan, you know, daubing her eyes and writing about healing speeches by the president. You know. um, and you have people who think it's, 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 it's somewhat disloyal to attack the president. I should think it'd be safer to think of them as buffoons and figures of fun, right? This is how you think of politicians in a parliamentary system. You don't take them seriously. There are no Peggy Noonans in other countries, for God's sakes. You know, but you know, here people, people will ask, what would Washington do? Well, nobody asks, what would Billy Pitt do, right? Nobody asks, what would John Diefenbaker do, you know, Johnny McDonald. It's just, it's absurd, right? I think that's healthier. I think it's dangerous when you are asked to revere the person who has all the guns in the room. I think that freedom is better secured when the head of state is a jug-eared prince, rather than somebody with all the power, the power over the IRS, for example. Yeah. You've spoken a bit about uh, lawless behavior. So, for example, the um, the spending of TARP funds uh, yeah. on the bailout of car companies, though the statute doesn't seem to allow for that. Now, couldn't can't lawless behavior happen under any system? So, uh, if um, if the president had to address Congress or had to be subjected to these sorts of inquiries, couldn't he just flout them? I mean, as you say. Uh, politicians know how to get votes. Isn't that at the end of the day the final test of any system? There is a tendency towards very strong executives in all systems, uh, modern first world nations, in parliamentary as well as presidential systems. Um, people in England and Canada have noted this and, and are dismayed by it. But the parliamentary systems aren't, not, aren't well understood in presidential countries. It's not really a matter of prime minister having all the power, do whatever you want. Rather, it's more like a, a corporate form of organization where the chief executive officer is the prime minister and the non-impuissant board of directors is the party elders. And if you're the prime minister and you're leading, it seems, to the party, the party down to defeat, then your days are going to be numbered. And that's what 
Margaret Thatcher discovered with her poll tax in 1990. It's with uh, Jean Chrétien discovered in 2004 with a bit of scandal involving the Liberal Party. All of a sudden, you know, somehow, invisibly, the hook is produced and the guy is gone. It's really actually the party that does it and that the party has got the vested interest in winning the election. Now, it's, it's, a, it's a rather effective way of disciplining people who seem to be leading you down to defeat. Um, by the way, um, even as presidential, empirically presidential governments are bad for liberty, they're also pretty corrupt. So parliamentary countries seem better able to constrain the kind of corruption of a kind we've been talking about. I wanted to say that America is exceptional, um, of course, <clears throat> but I, I didn't want to say, as many do, that this is the freest country in the world because of our constitution. What I wanted to say is, well, firstly, it's not the freest country in the world, but it's free. Right? But if it's free, it's free in spite of its constitution and not because of it. Right? Because the, the logic, the grim logic of presidential rule is it leads towards an Argentinian solution. I mean, and look, I don't want to say, for heaven's sakes, that all presidential countries apart from America are, are unfree. Name three. Not so easy, huh? France, semi-presidential, right? Cabinet can, the Chamber of Deputies can replace the cabinet, right? We might have gotten there. The Supreme Court had something to say about that in Myers. Um, I'm all on the side, of course, of people who want to impeach presidents, you know. Incidentally, do you know how it happened that the impeachment power happened? It was just at the end of the convention. It was September 4. The person, I think, the most important person in the convention, Governor Morris, came up with the report of the Committee on Unfinished Parts. And what he did is he changed the impeachment proceeding from a majority of the Senate to two-thirds. This was just slipped in at the last moment. There was so much going on, everybody wanted to go home that they didn't talk about it. But there it is, two thirds. So here's my trivia question. In order therefore to impeach a president, what you'd want to see would be a president of one party and the house in the control of another party and two thirds of a Senate in the control of another party. And that's happened once in American history. When was that? Give me a year. Yep, 1868. Because Jackson was a Democrat, right? And this was kind of Thaddeus Stevens' time. But it's not going to happen very often, is it? Johnson. Think, think Johnson. what it would have been like had <clears throat> Governor Morris, who wanted, by the way, I mean, he was a, one of us, he and Franklin, I think, were the smartest people there. All right? What would it have been like had it been 50 and not two thirds, or 50% and not two thirds? Well, do you remember in 1998, the impeachment proceedings with respect to Clinton? Do you remember what the vote was in the Senate? It was 50, 50 votes to convict in the Senate. Now, that's not enough to convict, right? You would have needed one more vote, yes? You would have needed the vice president's vote. And the vice president was Al Gore. Wouldn't it have been fun to see what Al Gore would have done? <laughs> Uh, a very bracing aspect of the book is uh, the digging back into the debates at the convention. And it's a real sort of object lesson. This, these things have been poured over, right? Generations and generations of scholars have looked at uh, the um, notes of the framing and tried to make sense of it. Um, what is bracing to discover and learn is you can go back and look at those exact same notes, but read them through a different lens, as we're kind of interrogate them with a different set of questions, and you can learn new things. And this book is a great sort of object lesson in that method. This, um, th there is new meaning to be wrung out of even these old documents if you ask them new and important questions. So the book is very important and valuable for that. 
And I wanted to ask, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, but are you uh, going to ask well, about the framers? I, well, I wanted to ask, so um, it, the book's extremely insightful about the convention. Now, in the book, you endorse a particular theory of constitutional interpretation, which is original understanding, original intention, originalism. Mm -hmm. That is, what would those folks have intended? What mm -hmm. would Madison have thought was going to happen? What would, uh, you know, what would Mason have thought was going to happen? And that's a, that is a distinctly minority view, mm -hmm. even among originalists. So most originalists believe that the project is to try to figure out the original public meaning of the document, what the document would have meant to an educated reader at the time. You're endorsing something different. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that and how you arrived at that. Well, why, should, I, why should we care about what they would have intended? Well, I didn't want to uh, really much take sides on that, but it, it did seem to me if you wanted to know if original meanings mattered, it seemed to me that you'd want to know what they really wanted, those, those framers. As for the project of trying to put yourself in the mind of public readers in 1787, why the most informed readers were those people in Philadelphia, the delegates themselves. So if you want to know what everyone thought of it, then you might as well start asking what they had to say about it. I found that the debates were the most fascinating set of disquisitions on the subject of a structure of liberty anywhere. Absolutely fascinating. Um, and fascinating because you had people going hammer and tongs at each other. You had people saying, uh, I don't trust you. And people saying, we're going to leave and our state will not join your union. And we had other people saying, Governor Morris, try that and we'll invade you and the hangman's noose will finish the business. So it was very vivid and, and very wise. And, and theorists tend not to understand what happened. I mean, Franklin's a good example. Um, historians tend to mock Franklin. Uh, he was clearly out of it. He made these long rambling speeches. But Franklin was the guy who kept things going, right? Franklin was the guy who could tell a good story in the middle of it and diffuse things. And he was also the guy who was clever enough to say, let's strike a committee and I'll, I'll, I'll make sure the members are people I agree with. So, you know, he, he kept things moving along that way. But really it was, I think, Governor Morris more than anyone. And who it was precisely not was James Madison. Right? the hypochondriac who outlived them all. Madison is said to be the father of the Constitution, but if that's the case, this is one of those cases, not unknown in delivery rooms, where the child bore little resemblance to the father. Because Madison came to town with the idea that what he wanted was a government where the Senate was appointed and where the president would be appointed by Congress and where the federal government would have a veto over all state legislation. And on every one of those, he was voted down in, in Philadelphia, but he actually succeeded because each one of those items is part of the Constitution of Canada. So yes, he was the father of a constitution, but just be clear about which constitution it was. Apart from that, I think it takes a special genius to start a war against Canada and then lose it. <laughs> Uh, and so that's another dimension of the book that is really bracing and original, the comparative dimension of it. This book is ringing new meaning from the comparison of the American structure, the English structure, and the Canadian structure. What brought you to that as a, as a way of analyzing this question? Well, I mean, I came from Canada, and uh, <laughs> uh, it seemed to make sense to contrast the two countries that most resemble each other and they're very different institutions. Uh, if Hollywood wants to try out a movie, it'll do it in, in Toronto, because the Toronto audiences are the audiences which best match the American demographic, right? You know, and we got everything. We got crack mares, we got, you know, whatever you want, it's in Toronto. <laughs> um, but crucially, it's very different in its constitutional structure. Now. My former colleague, Marty Lipset, had a lot of, uh, wrote a cut, two books on this subject. And he said, well, it's all a matter of you know, different social norms. But I don't think that 
explains much. The, pr the problem about those sociological explanations is they're tautological. They come down to saying, well, social norms are different in the two countries because social norms are different. Well, I prefer to say, no, it's the institutions that are different. We build our institutions, and then our institutions build us. So these are, the difference then is uh, a country where you're encouraged to laugh at politicians and not revere them, where you can easily get rid of a leader you don't like, and where a leader has to appear before parliament and take uh, all the slings and arrows that are thrown his way, that's not a system that's much designed for the kind of imperious person who does well in a presidential system. You know, the inflated ego and all that. I mean, those kinds of people tend not to be good House of Commons people. Right? I mean, I'll, I'll, Hard to describe, but uh, you know, from the people I know in, in the House of Commons, yes, it's quite different. Uh. It is a great treat to read a provocative book and then get to sit down and ask all the questions that you were thinking as you read the book with the author that very evening. So it's a treat for me, and I could do it all evening, but I think we have a couple hundred people here yeah, who right. uh, want to crack at you. So yeah. let's, uh, why don't we get some audience questions, if we could. Uh, we've got a couple in the back there. There's one in the, in the back row. Now, I think we have mics that are going around. If yeah. we don't, I won't hear you. Yeah, there's a mic. And we had a hand if in the back row there. If you do, I probably won't hear you anyway. There we go. Let me say one other thing. I've been talking about Obama all this time. You know, it, it's been a gradual process. I think it's taken it to a new level. But for heaven's sakes, it's been going on before. I mean, the, the Department of Homeland Security was created by executive order, right? And even the Bush derangement syndrome of 10 years back seems to be an example of, the, of what I'm describing. Because you're supposed to, you're supposed to be like Peggy Noonan, for God's sake. You're supposed to love the president. But if you disagree with him, you have to hate him like a spurned lover. Better to laugh at him. There was a question in the back. Uh, Baron Soka, Tech Freedom. Uh, so I'm fascinated by your, your argument that we need, would be better off with a more parliamentary system, especially with confrontation uh, between Congress and, and ministers. And so in that respect, I'm really curious to, to know, uh, I've never really fully explored one of the most notable innovations of the Confederate Constitution, which was to authorize Congress to grant a seat to cabinet ministers in the House and to require them to answer questions. And so I'm just curious, have you followed that uh, theme, that idea through American history? Um, and do you see today, do you see practical ways that uh, short of actually giving them a seat on the chamber floors, which wouldn't really do much, that uh, ministers who run departments, in our case, you know, cabinet secretaries, could be better called to account to explain themselves in the way that they are in, in parliamentary systems, uh, beyond the simple oversight hearings, which as you probably know, are sort of uh, meaningless theater. Well, um, I mean, constitutional, any, any idea that we might change things by way of amending the Constitution seems to me plainly visionary and imaginary. So what you're stuck with is what one has now and what can one do. Uh, you have select committees now, right? Um, I recommended a couple of things. I kind of, I didn't want to end on a down note. I mean, I always want something positive at the end. So my pause, one of my positive suggestions is, gee, it would really help if Congress cleaned up its act. Now, how do you clean up your act if you're Congress? Well, one thing you do is try to run as a national party, which means, as the Tea Party tried to do, get rid of earmarks, although they're still with us, of course. Um, see, there is this difference between parliamentary regimes and, and, uh, and presidential regimes. Madison worried about majoritarian oppression, the majority oppressing a minority. He didn't think about minoritarian oppression, which is the story of the John Murtha International Airport in Johnstown, right? It's the idea of how in a separation of powers regime, there's an incentive to move part of the public monies to your own district. And that doesn't happen so much in parliamentary regimes because you run as a national party and any 
special deals you have with one constituency, uh, that's not going to wash with the rest of the country. So there, there, there's still a little bit of that in any parliamentary system. But any, you know, empirical studies of this have, have said, no, far, far less, right? So when you have a political party in England or Canada, they're going to run nationally. They're not going to run against one particular region, or they're not going to try to do what, say, Robert Byrd or John Murtha would do, is, which is put it all in West Virginia or, or, or in Johnstown. Um, Newt Gingrich tried this in 1994, and he was really quite successful. And so what you need is a Speaker of the House with the power of a Gingrich who can say, this is our platform and we won't, we won't depart from it in any way. That would be a start. But you know, at this point, it's so hard, right? I mean, if there's ever a battle between the President and Congress, you have kind of the logic of presidential rule is you have one person elected by the country as a whole against 435 fractious people led by a speaker from someplace in Ohio you never heard of. It's no contest. Right. If, on the other hand, you had a national party running nationally saying, this is what we do, then you try to you tilt the odds a little bit in your favor. Uh, one suggestion. Yep, you're in the middle. What's your take on uh, corporate cronyism and the role this is playing in the, uh, the breakdown of checks and balances in the current administration? And also, do you have any ideas as to how to rectify that? Um, I don't know. A friend of mine worked hard on term limits in the 1990s until he was stopped by the Supreme Court. <clears throat> he would have simply, if, if this had been enacted, it simply would have created a lot more lobbyists, I guess. Um, in a way, that's a separate issue. My present project, which we're not going to talk about, is, has to do with income mobility, which is a problem of crony capitalism, amongst other things. It seems to me American politics is, importantly, a game of uh, kind of a red Tory phenomenon. You know, Disraeli in the 19th century, a union of the upper class and the lower class against the middle. It seems to me aristocracy is a natural default state of any society, and that is always an effort to try to produce a society where people in the middle can get ahead. And it's so hard when all the institutions seem to work against that, right? Where a public school system, which was supposed to be the elevator to the middle class, seems to be stuck in the basement, right? Where the in immigration system is geared towards bringing in maids and gardeners for the upper class as opposed to entrepreneurs where you have a rule of law problem that makes it easier to get ahead of your well plugged in branche, the crony capitalism you spoke of. Yes, uh, about four rows back over here. Hi. Thank you for your talk. Um, I'm sort of interested in the other side of the coin, in the parliamentary side. So you raised the examples of uh, Cretchen in Canada and Thatcher in Europe. And while they were yanked off at the end, um, the Senates or the House of Lords in both countries, as well as the monarchs, are largely figureheads. And both of them had won successive majorities in the decade plus prior. And as a result, wielded a great deal of power. So is there not some value to having the ability for the opposing party to control one, if not both, of the chambers, even if it's not nearly as powerful as the president? I didn't quite understand. Uh, can you say just a bit more about that? So you're asking about, um, the, about divided government and... Yeah, so the, the two examples you gave, both of those uh, leaders won successive majorities. The upper chambers in both of those examples are largely figurehead. They don't wield nearly as much power. And the heads of state in both of those examples are also somewhat figureheads. So you effectively have a government, both in Cretchen and Thatcher's case, where there's one person with successive majorities ruling for a decade or longer. Whereas in the United States, even with a very powerful president who's reelected, 
noted, there uh, seems to be a larger percentage of the time that at least one of the houses of Congress is controlled by the opposition party. Yeah, that seems to me, um, I'm glad you said that, because that seems to me one of the chief defects of the presidential regime. You know, I, I don't think much of Madison, but I have a chapter called Madisonian Infirmities, because everybody loves Madison, so why not? And it, the great infirmity, it seems to me, is, is, is divided government, right? Which makes it so difficult to get rid of laws you don't like. Now, here's the thing. In a parliamentary regime, the government has a reverse gear. Whereas here, what happens is you pass laws, and if they're bad laws, they're turned into the laws of the Medes and the Persians. You can't get rid of them. It seems to me that, uh, well, you know, one of my heroes, Barry Goldwater said, uh, if I'm elected, I don't want to pass laws, I want to repeal them. Maybe those of, if there are some of you who didn't like Goldwater, maybe some of you today can think of more laws you'd like to repeal than laws you'd like to enact. We're kind of bad enough already, it seems to me, right? Well, it, I, don't want not, I don't want progress, things are bad enough already. Well, in an era of divided government, you would expect that it would be harder to make new laws and also harder to repeal laws that are on the books, but right. how would you net those things out? Well, um, I have an argument for that. The argument is um, that it's easier to tell whether a law is good or bad with the advantage of hindsight. Right? Hindsight's always 2020. So you pass a law in ignorance not knowing quite what it's going to turn out to be. Obamacare, right? And then you've got it. And you can't change it. You're stuck with it, right? Because it's so hard to, to repeal a law. Right? You know, whereas in a parliamentary system, you know, easiest thing in the world. Now, if it's the case that it's harder to pass a law, then you might say, as you have, yes, but that's going to screen off bad laws up front. Well, yes, okay. Um, I don't see much evidence of that screening in the United States, but um, if that is the case, then it still is the case that reversibility matters more than ex ante screening because of the hindsight advantage. You really don't know what's in the darn thing until you pass it, right? That was, wasn't that what Nancy Pelosi said? She was right, right? But then people found out and then it was too late. I'd like to be able to repeal laws, bad laws. It's, it's, it's hard to do. I have the lady in white in the fourth row here. Um, Mr. Buckley, first of all, thank you for making this available. It's very interesting, and I'm really looking forward to reading your book. Uh, something that you put your finger on, I don't know whether it's a contradiction in this case or a complication, but you mentioned how, let's say, for example, the upcoming elections, relative, of course, to solving the problem of the Crown government, the way it seems to be growing, you mentioned that the upcoming elections may or may not be irrelevant. You mentioned that it may or may not be curable in the courts or from the House or the Senate. You alluded to the fact that in Canada, in fact, it was the voters that got rid of a bad administration. Um, but then you also mentioned that Obama bases some of his decisions to enforce, not enforce, on the fact that he holds already the sway of the populace. Mm -hmm. And to me personally, of all the people in history, he reminds me the most of Evita Peron having seduced a nation. So where finally is the answer to the repair? If it is with the voters, how do we take a population that seems to be locked into a mainstream media feed Every that other, every other per the sorry. Whole regime or part of the whole machinery and finally fix the thing. Every other presidential government is, um, I guess with the exception of France, which is semi-presidential, has tumbled into a form of authoritarian government. And there is your American exceptionalism for you. As I say, it's exceptional because it's free in spite of its constitution. You're asking about the future? I don't know. If you ask about the future, you're asking who will be around 20 years from now or 40 years from now? Well, that's a question of you know, people who are young today, immigrants uh, of the 
people who are young today, I suspect there are some who would be quite happy were he to decide that he wanted to enforce same-sex marriage to vote for President Putin, right? That is to say it all comes down to politics. The, the spirit of American constitutionalism seems to be gone, right? Political debates today seem to be not about the structure of government, but, but the narrow issue. If it's your issue, fine. How you get there, it doesn't matter so much. So that's, um, the, you know, that's slightly grim. As, as for immigration, can I, can I yes. Just interrupt to ask. So, uh, what do you make of the Tea Party movement? And would you say that uh, that was a quite a potent political force, a national force, about the structure of government? Do you remember after the 2008 election, um, Bill Kristol in the Weekly Standard said, "Don't worry, we're still a center-right country." How many people here think this is a center-right country? It's a centrist country possibly. Um, the Tea Party movement was extremely interesting. It's a minority phenomenon, is it not? So, um, when, when, you know, without attaching labels, I, I'm in favor of uh, any movement that seeks to restrain presidential power, and I would be in favor of impeaching presidents for high crimes or misdemeanors, or just for the spirit of a thing. As for immigration, I'll just mention this. Um, do you know immigrants in Canada vote massively Tory? Right? How is that? Well, the system of immigration is entirely different. It's, it's much more of an immigration country. It's, you know, it's much more foreign-born. It's about 20% foreign-born versus 13 here. And, uh, and yet, you know, the Tory party is extremely good at reaching out to new arrivals. There's a, a minister called Curry in a hurry. I mean, if there's ever any kind of an Indian get together, he's there, right? Um, politicians here don't do that kind of outreach. They're not so entrepreneurial. As, and, and the policy itself is up there is one based not so much on family preferences as based on attracting people who are going to add to the economy. You know, but here, by the way, I mean, people, the debate here is, oh, are the immigrants, you know, better skilled than your Native American? That's not a very high bar, is it? <laughs> Gentleman in the aisle here, fifth row. Thank you. Very interesting uh, talk and thesis, and um, I'd like to 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 pose a question about the difference within the, the segments of the United States and similar segments or maybe corresponding differences in Canada. And my perception in the United States or my premise is that uh, we're in a sense two countries and there's uh, a certain population here, mostly urban, that could be made unfree in a minute. And there is a rural population that would be very hard to, to tame. And in Canada, I'm not that familiar, but I have the impression that Eastern Canada and Western Canada are generally quite different along similar lines, from, different from each other. Um, does that figure into the um, well, it's, it's why we may still yeah, be exceptional? The, the, the big difference, of course, is... is Bilingualism. I mean, if, if, if you're a Canadian, to paraphrase William Faulkner, it, it is always 13 September 1759, and there you are in the Plains of Abraham, poised between both armies, anxious for victory, but not willing to see either side defeated. That's the kind of compromise you have to make. I mean, it's, it's a structure which is geared towards deals making and moderation, and um, yeah. you also come out thinking that, like the Khedives of Egypt, civilization is an Anglo-French condominium. So yes, we have those kinds of, uh, of differences, but it's chiefly language. Yes, in the fourth row here.
I love respond, <laughs> responding to the, the insatiable American interest in Canada. Just <laughs> <laughs> You've mentioned uh, corruption uh, two or three times in your talk, and, and this is a concept that the academic left likes to use to try to justify restrictions on uh, political activity, political spending. And I was wondering if you think uh, that, the, that the, our entire political system of how we elect leaders is corrupt, and would, do you agree with those laws? And, uh, does that derive from the Constitution? Yeah, it, things don't translate well always. I mean, uh, there are strict forms of campaign spending laws in Canada, and moreover, when an election is called, the vote will be six weeks later. I mean, an election was called in Ontario two weeks ago. There'll be a, a vote in a month. I mean, it's, 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 it's hard to, and, and you can call, if you're in power, you can call an election whenever you want. Um, that wouldn't translate here. Campaign finance laws, ask Dinesh D'Souza. Um, what, I, what concerns me is the way laws, federal criminal laws of the kind face, you know, that Dinesh has just pleaded to, um, are a trap for people with inconvenient thoughts and beliefs. I mean, that, that strikes me as really dangerous. You know, the... Um, Conrad Black is fond of saying that with 5% of the world's population, America is 25% of the world's prisoners, uh, more in absolute numbers than any other country, including possibly China, um, and that the conviction rate is like 99.5%. I mean, point f f half of 1% emerge acquitted. It's, it, it, you know, but in Canada, it's like 40%, right? And then apart from everything else, there's, um, there's Mark Stein's point, which is the process is the punishment. Even, even if at the end of the day, you, you, you're found innocent, you know, you don't get your reputation back, and you've spent years in, in the troughs of the American criminal justice system. I mean, talk, talk about dangers to liberty. All you have to do is imagine an ambitious president, revered by the people, revered by the press, who unleashes a, an attorney general and uh, you know a few ambitious prosecutors here and there, and then let nature take its course. And a media, of course, that doesn't see a problem with that. And when you have that, it seems to me you have you have a country that's not quite free. Did you say that there was a forty percent acquittal rate in Canada? Yeah. Really? But is there, is there plea bargaining? Is there the same level of plea bargaining? Yeah. Interesting. Uh, yes, in the seventh or eighth row at the edge. Got mics coming around to you. Should we do one or two more? Frank. Yeah, right. Sure. You have discussed the relationship of check and balance between executive and legislative at the federal level yeah. in terms of the, pres the executive steamrolling and power aggrandizing to the president over a long period of time. Would you develop, though, the distinction of the aggrandizement of power in the federal executive because of the, how the nature of the relationship between the states and the federal government might not have developed over time the way the founders had originally thought that it might? And that the, to the extent that the states might have been a check against federal power, to the extent that hasn't happened, that that has been a, uh, a means of aggrandizement of power in the federal executive? I'm not following this because I see federalism as separated in a watertight compartment from the issues I'm describing. I mean, you can have different kinds of federalism. It seems to be a very weak kind in this country. Um, and of course, the framers had a very different idea about how the states would constrain the federal government. Um, but whatever your kind of federalism, I don't know how that connects with how the federal government is run. I mean, it is true that as power has become greater in Washington, then the office of the president becomes more important. It, it was something the framers never never anticipated. They, I mean, they, they thought that Roger Sherman thought that the executive 
would be like a person who opens up an Ikea box and he's got the instructions and he puts the table together, right? Purely mechanical. It, it couldn't be that. And as the regulatory state expanded and as more and more power was vested in the regulators and there was only one person who might rein them in, the, the president, then his office became vastly more important as a consequence. Yeah, you know, Lord Hewer described this in 1929 as a new despotism. It's, it's not a new insight, of course. Uh, it's a great and lively discussion. We'd love to go all night, but I think we have time for just one more. Is there, uh, we have one in the back over here. Shout it out. <laughs> the mic's coming around to you, I think. Sorry, it's, it's um, seventh or eighth row here on the, on the edge. Here, here's, your, here's your mic right here. Oh, no. Sorry to hold you guys up. Well, I want to thank you, sir. I've been on the edge of my seat listening very attentively. And um, I'll narrow it. I have a bunch of questions. I'll narrow it down to one, basically. Um, with the addendum that I noticed, my Canadian friends, they're not, you don't suffer from the cancer of political correctness like we do in America. You have Little Mosque on the Prairie. You have Curry in a Hurry. Canadians seem much more at ease joking amongst themselves. And like you said, the Tory party gets a whole bunch of immigrants, you yeah. know, unlike in our country where my Democrats tend to exploit racial divisions to help them get votes, and it's like a downward spiral, which is not pretty. So my question is, how much do you think that, in my observation, as a lifelong Democrat, who most of my friends are Republicans, the cancer of political correctness contributes to our cultural erosion as far as the breakdown of authority, not holding people accountable, our guilty criminals notwithstanding. I'll be quiet and listen to your answer. Thanks again, sir. Well, it's all over. Um, there was something called the Canadian Human Rights Code, section 13 of which gave Mark Stein a, a terrible time. Uh, you know, r roughly he talked about uh, Islamophobia and was not taken to court, but brought before human rights tribunals, which is pretty near the same thing. And then after people realized that this was really a free speech issue, do you know what happened? Well, what happened was parliament repealed the law. Parliaments can do that. I mean, the, the experience, you know, the experience is, is, is in other respects wholly different. You know that uh, Ten percent of the loyalists were uh, ex-slaves. That the Indians were always on the side of the French and the British. I mean, it just, just you know, I mean, very, very, very different mindset. But uh, somehow, at this point, when it comes down to freedom, um, they're pretty close. I mean, you know, I, I grew up in Western Canada. Fraser does a ranking of states and provinces in terms of, of freedom. So number one is Alberta, number two is Saskatchewan, number three is Delaware. So you get Quebec down there. So it's, 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 it's actually a North American society in many ways. And it's, you know, and in, in fact, I think if you want to understand American history, you really have to have a continental perspective. I mean, it helps, for example, to understand the alliances between the southern states and, and the Canadian provinces prior to the Civil War over free trade. So it was, um, um, it was always the case that there was a lot of back and forth looking, at least from a Canadian perspective. Sir John A. Macdonald, um, one of the authors of Canadian Confederation, brought with him Madison's notes to uh, the Quebec Conference in 1864 that, that produced Canadian Confederation. But it was a very different sort of thing. I mean, in Washington, in Philadelphia, the delegates met under the stern gaze of George Washington. They all had a sense of a high calling. Whereas the delegates to the Charlottetown Conference and the Quebec Conference in Canada did not think that constitution making was inconsistent with a great lark and wonderful parties and great dances with the bullion French Canadians. It was, they had a lot of fun. I hope you did. 
From where I'm sitting, I can't help but notice that a bar's been set up over there, and it looks Whoa. like there's one over here as well. Once again, the book is The Once and Future King. The author is Frank Buckley, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. You bet. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. Well done.